I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly. So hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. All right, y'all, let's go ahead and jump into it. Those of us joining us a little bit late, um, hopefully won't miss too much, but thanks everyone for joining us and welcome to uh, today's Rupa University live class presented by Rupa Health, the simplest way to order specialty lab work. My name is Adrian Martinez and I will be your host for this afternoon. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us, Dr. Mark Philiday, here to discuss mold illness and more specifically, the application of mycotox in your clinical practice. Before jumping into anything, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Mm -hmm. Everyone joining will be muted by default, but don't fret. If you have any questions, feel free to use that Q&A button down in the bottom right, and we'll host a live Q&A session after the end of the presentation. If you have, uh, or excuse me, if you're uh, following along after that Q&A, yours truly will be doing a quick walkthrough of Rupa Health, chatting about who we are, what we do, and why we are so passionate about functional medicine. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in. I'd love to introduce Dr. Philiday. For those of you who are unfamiliar with him, he is an internal medicine physician who completed his training in general internal medicine at Brown University and is the director of integrative medicine for the Amen Clinics. He is an officially trained member of ILADS and treats Lyme diseases and mold illness with both natural and conventional treatments. He specializes in hormone replacement therapy uh, and the treatment of mental health disorders utilizing a functional medicine approach and is a member of the Millennium TBI Network Treating Brain Injury. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Philiday. We're so excited to have you with us. I'll let you take it from here. Glad to be here. Hello, folks. Uh, some of you may have heard my previous lectures on mold mycotoxins. I've been doing it for several years at IMMH and Great Plains. Uh, this is not my usual talk. So this one is more specific uh, for the GPL mycotoxin test, because that's what we're talking about today. So uh, this is actually kind of a combination of another lecture from one of the scientists at GPL, uh, as well as some of my stuff. So I'll cover all the bases. So what are we going to talk about? So mycotoxins, how are they detected? Uh, what kind of symptoms are we going to see that are associated with mold exposure? Which mycotoxins does GPL measure? Uh, how does the profile and OAT work together? We'll get that, uh, to that towards the end, hopefully with enough time. Uh, and how do we treat? Now, I'm not going to talk much about treatment. We're not going to have nearly enough time for that today. But um, we'll talk about the testing. Certainly. So why am I even doing this? Well, because of uh, this. So at the Amen Clinic, you know, what we, we do brain stuff here. And basically every patient that I see, that we see, has a brain scan. So this is a great tool for me as a functional medicine doc uh, to see how their brain looks. And so if you want a brain that looks like this one over here, you know, I'm, I think you can see my cursor. Someone let me know if you can't. Um, so that's a healthy brain scan, and this one is not so good. You don't have to be a radiologist to figure this out, right? It's pretty clear that the one on the right has a problem. So part of my differential is always mold exposure, which is found in the history, certainly. Again, pretty clear which one is abnormal here. And you don't have to be a radiologist. Uh, patients like this as well, because again, it's clear to see, family members can see. So this is where I start much of my investigation. So mycotoxins, these are basically the metabolites produced by fungi. Um, and this can cause disease and does cause disease in humans and animals. So mycotox those are the mycotoxins. Mycotoxicosis is the illness from the toxins. Very wide, a broad, uh, array of organs that are targeted by mycotoxins. Again, in my usual talk, I go into depth on all of that, uh, but it really affects every organ system in the body, brain, liver, kidney, endocrine, immune system, uh, the gut for sure. So uh, what's the severity? Why are some people affected and some not with the same exposure? Well, it all depends on the terrain, right? We're all aware of that in functional medicine. Some people can handle more mold or more mercury or more lime than others. So the, the exposure duration and dose is very important. 
the type of mycotoxin, uh, of course, their age and genetics and the whole terrain, their health and nutritional status, which fits into that as well. And what else, what else is filling up their toxic bucket, right? So are they full of metals and all the other goodies, glyphosate that we're all bombarded with, let alone EMF and who knows what else. So, right, so that's, that's why some people get sick with this and some don't, just like all the other conditions we see. So again, these are chemicals that produce toxic results. These are not really proteins. So you, you, they're not usually detected by the immune system. You can do antibody testing for these, but not for, for the mold, but not the toxins. So there is a company out there that's claiming to do that. I'm not sure about that. Uh, in any case, uh, you can check for mold antibodies, but not mycotoxins per se. So these are very <clears throat> toxic, disruptive uh, chemicals that have myriad effects all over the body again, and some are worse than others. So where do you get the exposure? Well, the most concerning is water damage buildings. This is what most of us are thinking of when we have mold ill patients. However, especially when you're trying to interpret mycotoxin testing, you do have to consider food sources. I've always talked about this for years. Uh, you can't automatically assume a positive test on a mycotox means they have a moldy house. They might, or a moldy car, or a moldy office, but some of them, particularly ochratoxin, can be from food. So just be aware of that. I, I see that issue all the time when I have patients referred for mold exposure. So uh, two primary responses to mold exposure. There's the allergic inflammatory, you can think of it almost like uh, pollen, seasonal allergy type responses. Any kind of mold could do that, even non-mycotoxin producing ones. And of course, then we have the toxin producing ones, which are much more concerning. Uh, so they can be uh, typical reactions like chills and stuffiness and your usual kind of cough, upper respiratory, eye irritation, wheezing. And many molds can do that. The toxic ones, those are the ones that are going to produce the CNS reactions that we're more concerned with. And again, not just CNS, but this is where you're going to get the mental health aspects. But again, uh, there's direct connection to leaky guts, which we'll see, and many other body disorders. So the, probably the most common symptom you'll see with mold exposure is brain fog. So some kind of cognitive impairment, uh, sleep issues, anxiety, brain fog, memory problems. Those are quite common um, irritability. So these can affect mental health in many aspects, headaches. So the specific mental health effects, again, it's kind of where my world is currently, uh, again, dementia, memory loss, anxiety, depression, cognitive impairment, very big, sleep issues. And in some severe cases, even uh, like derealization, depersonalization, where you're almost looking through a lens at the world. Pandas can do that as well, or pans can do that as well. So not all molds produce toxins, but many do. So these are some of the more common ones. Many of these, uh, like deoxyenovalanol <clears throat> and these eumonosins, uh, T2, H2, these are in food and they're a very big deal in the animal business, which we'll see here in a bit. Uh, penicillium and aspergillus are universal. So if you have a moldy house, you're gonna have those two there. It's almost a guarantee. Those are also the most common ones in food, uh, aspergillus and penicillium. Catomium is from catoglobus and mycotoxin is from catomium. That's one of the quote bad ones uh, in your house. Not typically in food, although <clears throat> I did this test five days in a row on myself and on one of the days, catomium, catoglobusin showed up. Same house, same office. So could it be in food? Possibly, but this is thought to be mostly water damaged buildings. <clears throat> Sorry about that. 
road. Uh, Stachybotrys is the one that we're most concerned about. Usually that's the real bad black mold, <clears throat> sorry, and, and wolemia. So usually stachy and wolemia, if you see them at all on any kind of a test, like an ERMI test, you got to have a lot of water for those, usually so a pretty damp uh, area for that to grow. So why do we even care? Well, if you have any of these organs over here, you care uh, because these affect all of those organs. Uh, different mycotoxins affect different organs. Some are notorious for causing certain problems. Uh, Zoralinone is very hormone disrupting. So this is associated with infertility and many other uh, reproductive issues in animals and likely people animals too. Uh, Ochratoxin, again, is very common. Uh, almost, virtually everyone has some level of ochratoxin from food. So more specifically on the testing. Um, currently, there are two main tests, main ways to test for mycotoxins. One is an ELISA test, which is basically antibody type testing. Uh, this is what the test cells look like. Now, this like many ELISA type tests, the drawback, a big drawback is you can have false positives. So cross reactivity to other things that aren't what you're looking for. Uh, same thing with antibody testing, you know, for many other things, you can have cross reactivity on Lyme tests, for instance, to viruses, et cetera. So um, that is one method. Uh, Great Plains uses mass spec. So mass spec is really the gold standard for almost any type of chemical testing, um, you don't get false positives. So if it shows up and there's specific peaks along the way, how this works, um, it's that substance. It's a known peak, nothing else is gonna do it. So a, a positive test on mass spec is a positive test, not false positive. Probably the, the greatest benefit is that so you get these peaks. Again, these peaks are well-known chemical compounds that aren't going to be positive unless it's there. So uh, again, very specific. That's why, again, mass spec is used all throughout chemistry and medicine when you're looking for specific things. So the test is also much more sensitive than ELISA. So again, if we go back to other picture, you saw some of those uh, wells were a little less yellow than the others, right? So there's gradations there. Um, so same thing with antibody testing, you can have sort of positive, but not all the way positive. So that is eliminated with, uh, with, with mass spec. So again, you're not guessing as much uh, what you do with ELISA. More strong. So again, more cost effective. You can analyze a lot more targets per sample and just much more sensitive. So again, the toxicity broad for mycotoxin exposure, CNS, we mentioned abdominal pain, uh, cancer can be connected because mycotoxins are extremely immunosuppressive. And if the mycotoxins themselves aren't causing your problem or your patient's problem. Exposure to mycotoxins can make anything there worse. Uh, similar to what we're seeing with, with COVID, reactivating other things that used to be under control. Now they're not. Mycotoxins can definitely do that. And this can explain some cases of chronic Lyme or chronic anything that just doesn't get better despite treatment because they're exposed to mold and they just can't get better. So uh, that I always, uh, my patients will say, the runway has to be clear for takeoff with whatever your problem is. And if you have mycotoxins blocking the runway, you're not gonna take off. Uh, similar things like metals. If you have a little mercury, you're, you're, just, you're, you're hindering your body's ability to heal. And, and in, in the case of mycotoxins, it can be severe. So you'll get, if you haven't done the test yet, you'll get a 
report that looks like this. Um, there are now GPL literally had to create this. So I actually helped them with the idea initially years ago to create this test, but there was there were no real human markers. Uh, this was literally let's test a whole bunch of people and see what shows up because there are no standards. There are standards in animals, but not for humans. So uh, the standards you see initially, they have changed with time <clears throat> because they just got more and more data to see what is average, what's normal. Uh, now, again, you're gonna probably see almost universally positive okra toxin at some level. Uh, I think an average is more like 10 to 13, which is gonna be in the red zone. So again, the, the your reference ranges are uh, a work in progress, many thousands of tests uh, done already. So we have a pretty good idea of where things are. Um, so the test will look like this. The black bar is the result. If nothing shows up, nothing was detected. So in the house, where is this problem gonna come from? Well, all over the place, right? So. Uh, if any of you folks are a uh, member of ICAI, <laughs> which I am, um, you'll be well aware of the indoor environmental professionals, right? That's, you wanna find a good one to work with if you don't already have one. Uh, these are the folks who are experts at this exact topic. Where's the problem? Good mold inspectors are, are first and foremost, good building inspectors. So they do a good building inspection to find out where the problems are. I remember the first time I tested mold in my house many years ago, um, I had a really good inspector come by and he was looking around the outside of the house and digging. I'm like, what are you doing? Check the house for mold. He's like, well, I am. And found all of these issues uh, where the mold was a problem, like dirt building up on the side of the house, which makes your sprinklers wet the dirt, which gets your wall wet, right? So again, good building inspectors are critical. Um, so plumbing leaks, roof leaks, wet basement. I've asked virtually every patient I have, uh, any reason to suspect mold exposure? Do you have any plumbing problems? Do you have, have you had a water roof leak or water leak or wet basement? And you'd be surprised how many people answer in the affirmative. Oh yeah, our basement gets wet every winter. Or yeah, I got these spots on the ceiling from the apartment above me, I'm not quite sure what they are. Um, so that's where your history comes in. Uh, that's extremely important. And it's not, Typically, the mold you're going to people say, oh, I don't see any mold. Well, you're not going to see it usually. It's hidden somewhere. So like behind the wallpaper here, uh, I wouldn't want to see that in my house. That's not good stuff. Or sometimes it manifests itself because something falls apart. So uh, walls just literally crumble from mold. This is in a bathroom. You can see here and bathrooms are notorious for having issues because of the moisture content. So you're not going to see this. Uh, you might see a spot here too, but you know, then it falls down and there's all the mold. Or under crawl spaces. So if you have a house flood, uh, especially more than once, or there's a small leak, it's chronic, you can get this. I and mean, you're not gonna see this, but there's air flowing through here. You're gonna be breathing this. Uh, so it, it mold anywhere can be a problem. Food can also be a source. Again, is it as bad as water damaged buildings? No, but I think you do have to keep this in your mind when you're reviewing tests. So many sources in food, largely in grains, wheat and corn are usually the worst. And there are actually surveys uh, like this one where they check the grains grown in every country. It's called the Bi this is the World Mycotoxin Survey. And you can see here in the US, you know, usually when something is red on a, on a graph, it's not good. So uh, we're actually worse off than the old Vladimir Putin over here in Russia, as far as our grains being contaminated with mycotoxins. So zeralinone you'll see here, uh, okra toxin, aflatoxin. Deoxynovalanol is the most common and we don't test for it quite yet. I'm working on a little project that might help that. So again, wheat, corn are usually the worst. They found with this survey that 96% of the grains tested had 10 or more mycotoxins. It was an average of 30 per sample. 
These are all the metabolites they check. So there's mold in food, uh, just be aware. And in the UK, UK actually not UK, it's uh, the EU, they actually reject food, even though they have uh, open borders, so to speak, where you, know, you can go from one country to another without a visa, they actually reject food from coming into the country from another country if there's a problem with it. And one of the biggest reasons for rejection is mycotoxin contamination right above bacterial infection. Again, the animal biz knows all about mold and mycotoxins. In my other lecture, I'll discuss this more in detail, but you can see here, they know what mold does what to what part of the animal. So um, embryonic loss, ovarian cysts, so zeralinone, well known to do that. Um, things that cause decreased performance, diarrhea, so GI issues, skin problems, uh, decreased feeding, vomiting, the oxynovalanol is actually called vomit toxin because it causes nausea and vomiting. So again, this is well known in the animal biz. They have a model of this for every animal. They have one for pigs and chickens and cows. We don't have a human one yet. This is moldy coffee. So yes, it's in food. Uh, you're not likely to see this level of mold. It's likely to be more invisible, but still on the bean itself. So it turns out how you grow and harvest your coffee or whoever's doing it, does it. Um, these, they they kind of lay these out, typically let them dry um, after processing or, or cleaning. And that's where the mold can happen. And then you drink the coffee and you get the mold. So again, it's in the food chain for sure. So these are some of the more common toxic fungi. So aspergillus, again, is nearly universal. And penicillium, stachybotrys. This is not likely to be in food much more water damage building. It loves to eat uh, particle board and, and uh, other household construction material. So these are uh, some of the ones, the ones that are measured on the mycotox test. Now there are many other mycotoxins. Uh, this is not a comprehensive test. There should be some more added as we go. So. If you have a patient you think is mold toxic and they have a negative test, there could be several reasons for that. Many, actually. Uh, it could be a toxin that's not measured. So that's one thing. It also, they don't detoxify well. They're not putting it out. That's why they're sick. Their roommate or whoever's in the same house is putting out tons of them. They're getting rid of it. So again, there are many reasons that you can have high suspicion and a negative test. So uh, these are the ones that are run on the GPL test currently. And again, you'll find some of these are more likely to be in food, like okra toxin. Some are less likely, like Procarin and particularly catagloboson. So okra toxin, ubiquitous uh, study in Germany showed 100% of people they tested had some level of okra toxin in them again, from food. So this affects kidney, none of these are good, right? So at any level, you really don't want them, uh, but some are gonna be less concerning than others. So this particularly in patients that have kidney issues, um, you're gonna, any level of, asp of okra toxin is probably not gonna be good for them. So uh, you might need to do some dietary and certainly some uh, building inspection with kidney issues. So it is in water damaged buildings, uh, it's nephrotoxic, immunosuppressive, high doses can have neurological symptoms. All of these are immune suppressing. Aflatoxin is really bad stuff. Um, this is one of the most carcinogenic substances known, uh, produced by aspergillus. Uh, there have been deaths in groups of people because of aflatoxin uh, contamination of uh, nuts, for instance, and all peanuts, for instance, uh, and also grains. Really bad for the liver, so it can cause liver failure. And more toxic in kids because of the body mass index. Uh, again, very liver toxic. There can be mental, abdominal, mental impairment, abdominal pain. Again, immunosuppressive. 
And because of the heavy liver burden, you can get, again, jaundice and frank liver failure. So uh, again, this is why it can also be carcinogenic. Literally disrupts the DNA. Gliotoxin. Um, this is produced um, by Aspergillus and Penicillium species. And again, known immunosuppressive, inhibits neutrophil functions, but this is why it's immunosuppressive. Um, mycophenolic acid produced by penicillium. I had a patient uh, that had an extremely high level. I mean, it was 25,000, I think, on, on the test. And I was like, what's going on here? Um, and she was on an immunosuppressive drug for her kidney transplant. It's mycophenolic acid. So I forgot, or maybe never knew, that uh, mycophenolic acid is actually used for immunosuppression on purpose. And uh, again, why you don't want a lot of it in your system. So this is also quite common from food. The numbers can vary quite a bit. Mine varied from five on one day to 250 on the other day, same week, varied diet. STG, uh, again, produced by aspergillus. This one is more likely to be from water damaged buildings, can be in food. Again, the grains and the nuts, anything that's stored is where the mold comes from. It's not like it lie around your counter and it got too moldy. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about moldy in the field before it was harvested, moldy in the silo or somewhere along the line. And then it just gets blended into products that you can't even see. Um, so again, none of these are good to have. Most of them are somehow immunosuppressive and or carcinogenic kidney and liver damage with STG. The trichothecenes or trichothecenes or tomato, tomato, um, these are the worst ones uh, as far as damage. So these are considered the, the most toxic group. Uh, many species produce these. Stachybotrys is the big one that we're concerned about in houses typically. Uh, Fusarium can also produce this. So these are very uh, protein disrupting and quite damaging. Zoralinone is less toxic, so to speak, than those others. However, extremely bad for reproduction. So um, this is well known again in the animal business. If you have a lot of the zoralinone in your pigs, they don't gain weight, they don't make little pigs. They don't go into heat. Same thing with chickens and cows and other animals. So it literally is an estrogen mimic, blocks the estrogen receptors. So it's, uh, and, and can mimic estrogen effects by binding. So not great stuff. So if you have a patient that happens to have a lot of fertility issues, this might be a very good for them. And I think it's probably a sort of a hidden reason that we have some of these infertility issues for no good reason. Um, so Roradin E, now that one is one of the bad trichothecenes, trichothecenes produced by Stachybotrys. So that's uh, the one you really don't want to find in your house. And it does take usually uh, quite a bit of moisture to grow. It's also a heavy, large um, mold. Now, some folks recommend using mold plates to check your house. I'm not a big fan of that um, for several reasons. One is that culture medium doesn't grow stachybotrys. So um, also these tend to be heavier and closer to the ground. So um, again, good mold inspection will detect this. Uh, Barucarin, so this is another trichothecene. Uh, easily moves the cloth across the plasma membrane, binds the ribosomes. This is another one you don't want much of. These are all on the GPL tests. So again, weight loss, growth retardation, nervous system disorders, skin. This one has broad effects across multiple systems. Also decreases reproductive capacity. 
And he add in, uh, this one can be found in food, so common grain contaminant. Uh, again, bad for the liver, bad for the immune system, causes inflammation. Many of these uh, are directly neurotoxic. Many of them are, will disrupt neurotransmitter production. Uh, so they have various effects directly and indirectly on the nervous system, particularly the brain. Many cause inflammation directly. Uh, so trying, and this is kind of a catch-all almost, uh, it's at the very end of the mycotox test. Um, many species produce it. Uh, a little tougher to track this one down because it is produced by several different species. So you can use that as evidence of mold exposure sort of in general. Again, not can't tell where it's coming from, but also found in food. Again, same grains and, and nuts, et cetera. Many of these are very thermally stable, which means if you have a cow that you're feeding moldy food to with mycotoxins in them, and it gets into their tissue, you can't cook it out. So it stays there. These are heat stable. So you can't, cooking things won't get rid of it either. That's why it's not necessarily all grains. Um, you can get this actually from animal protein too. Uh, ketomium, again, this is uh, another one that's mo more com much more common indoor. Uh, from contaminated water damaged buildings, highly toxic. It's one of the kind of top five toxic molds, uh, often found along with stachybotrys. So uh, the oat test. Now, many of you, the organic acid test, uh, use this or have heard of it. This, I'm not going to go through the whole oat test. That's a whole different talk, but the, particularly the first page um, and a bit of the second uh, can be can help you a lot with trying to figure out if your patient is colonized with mold. So you can be in a in a water damaged building, let's say apartment. You're sick. You move out. You feel better or not. You can bring it with you. So smaller molds like Aspergillus you can be colonized with. You know, the only time we ever hear about mold in medical school is with aspergillomas, right? Those are the fungal balls in the lung, usually with HIV or some kind of immunocompromised patient. But you can still be colonized with the stuff and not be, you know, an HIV patient. So you can be colonized in your respiratory tract, your nose, your sinuses, your lungs, your bronchi, and your gut. So this can help determine that because there are certain markers on the oat test, especially the first page, uh, that can hint at that. So at least the, you can do the, the moat, right? That's the, the first page. If you don't want to do the whole organic acid test or you've already done it and you want to repeat just the first page, uh, you can order that. So the other parts of the oat that are helpful um, are the mold colonization, glutathione status, mitochondrial health, and gut health, which you can find on the organic acid test. So again, if you can be colonized with this, I do a lot of nasal testing, um, not particularly for uh, bacteria. Well, you can do a DNA test, which I do, um, and you can also do a culture. Either one can be helpful. There's kind of pros and cons to each but I always check for fungi with whatever type of sample I'm doing, uh, which you can find not infrequently growing in the nose. And probably most of you or many of you know that chronic sinus infections are often fungal and they're, it's never thought of, which is why they never go away. So you keep taking antibiotics over and over again because there's a bacterial overgrowth on the bottom line fungal overgrowth. So um, always think fungal when you're talking about nasal stuff. So um, with colonization, uh, GPL found that these two markers are higher in people that have positive mycotoxin tests compared to mycotoxin negative. So those are these tests. 
So that's why on the current uh, oat test, you'll see aspergillus in little parentheses under several of these, two, four, five, six, I think. Um, so if those are elevated, those are suggesting possible colonization with aspergillus. Any of these markers elevated when you have some kind of a fungal issue, could be candida, could be mold. So that's why it's, it's helpful to do them both together, the mycotox and the organic acid. Now, this is where the colonization issue comes in. So uh, aspergillus spores are small. They're, they can go pretty far into your lung. Stachybotrys, not so much because it's a much bigger spore. So as spore size gets bigger, it's just not going to get as far into your respiratory tract. And of course, glutathione is uh, one of our main tools for many things in functional medicine. Um, so many papers written on the importance of glutathione. We don't need to talk much about that. Um, so aflatoxins can directly affect hepatic function and deplete glutathione directly. And also the damage from the mycotoxins is worse with depleted glutathione. So of course, you know, we use glutathione uh, orally, IV, uh, precursors like NAC. So there are markers on the organic acid test that can show you glutathione status. Uh, this little asterisk on several of the markers there means if it's elevated, it could be a deficiency of a certain thing like glutathione. Same thing on the some of the vitamin markers. So mitochondrial function, this is you know the powerhouse of every cell. There are mitochondrial markers on the oat test as well. And I'm not going to belabor, belabor the oat too much, but there are markers that can help with mold exposed patients. So lactic and succinic. Now these can be elevated uh, with fasting sometimes as well. So on the oat, um, I look for markers that are substantially elevated or whole groups that are off. Everyone's probably going to have a few markers that are off here and there. But these two in particular um, are related to mitochondrial status. And gut health. So this is, uh, again, a real big thing in the animal mold business. Um, well known that mycotoxins cause leaky gut syndrome, uh, which is not good for raising your animals. Um, again, there's a direct toxic effect on the gut intestinal barrier, um, human exposure to certain mycotoxins, particularly deoxynovalanol. Again, that's vomitoxin, the most common one in food, um, may play an important role in the etiology of various chronic intestinal inflammatory diseases like IBD uh, and food allergies. So um, working on checking for Dawn, we'll see how that comes out. I've been wanting that test for quite some time. Um, so particularly in children. So this may be particularly related to allergies, maybe mast cell activation syndrome and lots of other things that are mysterious to us currently. Opportunistic pathogens. So um, it turns out also, I'm gonna have another printout on another, uh, or another uh, excerpt from a study showing that mycotoxin exposure also directly affects your microbiome in a bad way, almost like antibiotics do. Um, so uh, direct uh, ingested mycotoxins can cause damage to the intestinal barrier. And we know if you have leaky gut, you probably have leaky brain. So other opportunistic pathogens. So again, mycotoxin negative uh, folks had less, we could say mycotoxin positive folks had a lot more candida and clostridia findings. So why is that? Well, fungi like candida may have the same uh, milieu they like to grow in. 
So that could be why you have more candida too. But remember, the mycotoxins are always immunosuppressive too. So if you have clostridia uh, or candida, it can make those worse, L less response from your body to treat them. And of course, there are markers for both of these on the organic acid test. All right, we did it. Four minutes to spare. Um, I guess we can do questions or I could talk a lot more about mold and testing. No, that was, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Philadelphia. That was uh, an amazing presentation. We have so many questions. So, so uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, let me pull up all these questions. So, so first question that we got from the audience, and I'm just going to go chronologically here. Um, can you chat about just what the difference between mold and mildew is? Yeah, so this is, um, this comes up a lot with patients um, asking, I ask them, do you have mold in your house anywhere? Oh yeah, it's in, the, it's in the bathroom. Where? It's in the shower. Oh, you mean the stuff between the tile? Yeah, that, that's not what we're talking about. That, that's mildew. It, it's in a fungi, but it's not gonna be toxin producing. I tell them the stuff you're worried about is what's behind the wall uh, or in the ceiling. So um, mildew is not considered toxigenic. And that's what people are you know, scrubbing off. They think they're you know, cleaning off their mold, but I tell them, like I had a, just yesterday had a patient um, and I was asking about mold and yes, they had some in the shower, but they also were scrubbing mold off the walls and the ceiling. And it kept coming through black spots, mold growing, and their landlord wouldn't do anything about it. They lived there for five years. Gosh, uh, not a good thing. So in any case, uh, that's not worrisome. Okay, perfect. Um, next question. Uh, we had an attendee who was curious if there are any caveats to interpreting this test in pediatric patients. For example, account levels for urine concentration or adjust the results based on age. Yeah, so um, it is uh, done, you know, versus creatinine. So it, in Europe, there's been quite a few studies with adults and kids. Uh, so it, it has been run in children, uh, in fact, sometimes more often than in adults. Um, so I think it's valid in kids. Now, with any collection that you do, I tell patients that it should be concentrated. So uh, when you collect the first morning urine, it should be pretty yellow. Now it says that in the instructions, some people don't read it. So if it's very dilute, you know, clear looking like water, throw it away, collect it on another day. So there may be that issue um, with, with, with detecting it. But again, the, uh, the children, the child's diet may play a role too. As I said, a lot of kids eat a lot of grain related stuff, bread, and you know, flour and all the things are, they're, they're pretty high in carbs. So you may see more uh, food related mycotoxins there. Yeah, that's perfect. And that actually leads really well into the next question here. Are food allergies related to mold? For example, high IgE? They could be kind of one of those last slides showing that, uh, you know, just because of the intestinal barrier disruption, you could have all kinds of related issues. So I don't do food allergy testing personally. I just find the test not super accurate. However, the ones that are usually show you what you're eating currently, which is because you have leaky gut. So I just go straight to the source of the problem. So yes, if you have intestinal barrier disruption from mycotoxins, you could develop food allergies, the really sensitivities, and again, more leaky gut related, maybe mast cell related, which can all be interconnected. Yeah, that's perfect. The next question here is more so about just like living conditions. Um, how much does living in a human environment impair healing, even if your home is found to be mold free? You know, for example, living in Rhode Island versus Florida. Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, I'll bring up mold uh, a patient, I suspect for whatever reason, and I say, oh, I live in uh, Tucson. You know, I, there's no mold here. It's very dry. Well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, matters somewhat, but I'll tell them all it takes is, is a leak, you know, a drip behind the wall, and now you've got moisture. So, you know, in Florida, you're going to have, you know, things don't even dry out there, right? You, your towel never gets dry. So you, you can have more kind of ambient mold, but it turns out the stuff that's 
kind of growing like that. Like in Hawaii, people have, you know, clothes get a little moldy just sitting in the closet. Um, that's not good, and it may be more allergenic, but it usually isn't the really bad stuff from uh, like stachybotrys, that sort of thing. So it tends to be more kind of ambient mold, and any good mold inspector will always test outdoor mold versus indoor. So uh, sometimes people just have moldy air. There's lots of trees outside, and <clears throat> if you open your doors, you know, to go in and out, you're going to get some of that coming in. So you always want to check indoor versus outdoor levels. And if it's moldier inside, then out, well, that's a problem. That's when you get the inspector to come in and figure it out. But yes, you may have more ambient mold in certain areas. Is that going to affect the way you heal? Mm, probably not. I don't think so. One reason that might be just off the top of my head is if you're in an area that's more humid, it's likely going to be more sun, so more vitamin D, uh, more heat. So I don't think that's a huge issue. I don't think people in Florida heal less well than they do in, you know, New York or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we have a message coming in that's more specific to the test. Um, does the lab give where each of the molds come from and what effect they have in humans, like the pig image on yes. the ports? They may not be able to remember the details. And just a quick shout out, they say thank you. And this is a great presentation. Yes, uh, when you get the report, uh, it will kind of break down where these come from. Um, it doesn't tell you exactly because many of them are, you know, crossover it could be many different species and many different sources. But yes, there is a little, there's bullet points for each mycotoxin. Beautiful. Um, we've got another one here. Can mold spores cause lung nodules? Yeah, uh, well, nodules, I mean, it's known to cause aspergillomas, which are fungal balls in the lung. So yes, um, depends what you mean by nodule and what the actual findings are. <clears throat> Most pulmonary nodules are, uh, well, many are old scar tissue, things like that. But yes, it could be, certainly. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, these are amazing questions. We, we're having a ton come in. So appreciate you going through all these. Um, yeah. Next question would be, can anything be done to protect fetuses and neonates from effects of mold exposure if the family cannot move from their existing living accommodation? Yeah, that's a toughie, you know, because the rule number one with mold illness or mold exposed patients is get out of the mold. <laughs> so um, otherwise you're, you know, kind of bailing water out of a sinking boat. So yeah, that's tough. Some people can't move. They don't have the means. They don't have the money. Whatever reason, they can't move. Like that family that was in the moldy house for five years. So if you can't, uh, you know, one of the main treatments in any case is to take binders. So you know, clays and charcoals and things like that. There are several products made specifically for this. Uh, so that would help you pull stuff out as much as you can with the exposure. And those binders are, are safe to take with kids. They don't, you know, pregnancy, it's just binders. They stay in the gut and pull things out. So even uh, fiber products could help with that. So um, that's what you'd have to do probably is, and if it's in a particular part of the house, um, try not to be there so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a situational approach here for you. So question on how to approach this situation. Fluid buildup all throughout the mastoid air cells significantly affecting uh, conductive hearing. It's hard to differentiate between allergy, candida, mold, viruses, bacteria, mycotoxins, so on and so forth. How would you approach that situation? Um, macron test or also whether it's uh, nebulizing anything in particular might be beneficial. Well, that can't really get into cases like that because there's way more information that's needed, you know, to sure. make heads or tails of that. Um, so I couldn't be specific, but um, I know this is a bit, uh, oh, what would you call, antithetical? No, uh, that's my word. Uh, against the grain, maybe. Sure. Um, I don't uh, treat Marcons. I think it's a normal commensal bacteria. Uh, either that or there's a massive epidemic of Marcons because probably half the people I test, even for regular, even for non-mold, I'll test them because they have sinus issues, uh, have Marcons. So again, that's against the grain for some folks. Um, so 
but personally, I, I don't treat Marcon's. I do the tests. I do that specific test, the micro DX test. Um, but I kind of ignore the Marcon's. I look for everything else that grows. So the bacteria and the fungi. Uh, and I'd also do a DNA test, microgen, which you don't need it to grow. So cultures help, but they can miss things that they don't grow. DNA probes don't. They can find everything. So in any case, because the, there was a mention of Marcon's there. But yeah. specific case is hard to say. I mean, you need a lot more information. Yeah. The classic need more information. That, that's great. Yeah. Um, once you avoid exposure, how long um, should you wait to test to normalize? Another good question, because I see, you know, mold cases. Uh, if you folks haven't, if you're just getting into this, um, be aware that many of these will end up in court and you might get a little old subpoena saying, doctor, what do you think? Um, so that's an issue uh, and, and it's not a fun one. So you might wanna be, some people like to do that, I don't. But in any case, um, the legal issues uh, can be a problem. What was a, an original question? Because it was on a legal issue. <laughs> Yeah, the, the question was more so just how long should you wait? Um, oh, yeah, okay. To avoid exposure, how long should you wait? Yeah, the, the connection there was because, uh, again, because of these cases, many times they come to me six months later. They, they've been away for six months from the exposure or longer, but they come in saying, I've been sick from old ever since I lived there. I'm still sick. And it was six months ago. So right. that's where the testing can be negative currently because they're not in the situation anymore, but the damage was done. So you could almost think of it like radiation exposure, kind of like you, you can be exposed to radiation and you get damaged from it, but there's no radiation left. But, so mycotoxins can be in the same boat where you were damaged, you're, you got leaky gut, you had brain inflammation, all those things started, but the mold isn't there anymore. So Usually, if, if you really want to see your current you know, environmental exposure, you do it in the environment, you're more likely to get a positive test. As far as leaving and when do you retest, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, are you, is a patient getting you know, detox therapy? Um, they're going to clear it much quicker. So it's a bit of a moving target um, when to test. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, speaking to treatment, can you comment on treatment beyond remediation, binders, and sauna? So, yeah, I mean, the, you know, removing yourself from the environment is key, critically, all the stuff we do functional medicine-wise for detoxification, sauna, binders, glutathione, et cetera. If you suspect colonization, uh, binders aren't going to work, right? Because if you have it in your nose, you could take binders all day. It's not going to get it out of your nose or your lungs or wherever it is. So you may need systemic therapy like systemic antifungals. Now that's a bit trickier to figure out. I've tried many tests to see um, if you can actually find fungi in the bloodstream. Sometimes you can, not very often. This includes candida. There, you can do PCR testing for aspergillus and candida in the bloodstream. Uh, negative quite often. So you may need systemic therapy. Uh, I don't do a lot of that. Some doctors dump antifungals on folks, um, many, you know, several, including uh, Ampho B, um, Sporinox, you know, those are commonly used. Fluconazole, commonly used, but there's a lot of resistance to fluconazole with many fungi. So again, that's a, kind of a different level of treatment, but you may need it. If, uh, for instance, you're out of the environment, you're still getting lots of mycotoxins coming out, you've kind of cleared up the food issue, maybe some colonization somewhere, which needs systemic therapy. Yeah, great answer. Last couple of questions here, since we, we are almost at the, the hour mark here, but do you ever do anything to provoke PTS or do testing pre and post provoking? Uh, good question. Uh, you don't want to use glutathione for provocation. Uh, that's from the GPL scientist that created the test. So um, with, particularly with mass spec, the glutathione can actually bind 
to the mycotoxin, which you want, but it's not going to come out at the peak uh, that it normally would. So you don't want to provoke with glutathione. You could provoke theoretically anyway with sauna or something to stir things up, so to speak. Um, so depends what you're provoking with, but don't use glutathione. All right, great. Um, is there any good literature supporting this work topic? Um, which part? There's that's a good question. That's a very general question. Yeah, because um, there's lots of lots of literature um, in the animal world on mycotoxins. I again, my usual talk covers a lot of that. A lot of the studies showing the damage to all the different organs and the brain, the gut. Um, so there is a lot of data there. Usually, animal studies. There are some human studies. Uh, all of them are from Europe. They don't really check it here for whatever reason. But yes, there are studies in humans um, with levels in the urine and the blood, uh, not specifically related to disease states. And of course, the whole water damage building thing, very little data there. There, there are studies, certainly, um, linking ill health to moldy buildings. So you know that stuff is available. As far as the direct effects on human health, not as much as I like to see. Yeah. Last couple of questions here. What's your favorite treatment for mold in children? Well, again, what's mold in children? I mean, is that a child with mold exposure, I assume? So again, it's uh, the same thing I do for an adult, binders. Um, mm -hmm. Now in adults, it's hard to, it depends on the age of the kid too. Um, I guess how early, another question there is how early can you uh, test binders on a child? Well, you can use binders really at any time. I mean, maybe not if they're teething, but I mean, you know, just out of the womb, uh, but binders are just harmless fiber products, right? So that stays in the gut. It's not going anywhere else. So those are pretty safe to use of any, any age, I would think. Uh, as far as sauna, you, know, you probably put a one-year-old in a sauna. So pretty much binders and anything else you can do to support detoxification. Yeah, great question. Um, great answer as well. So final question here, uh, would just simply be, why would you recommend uh, Great Plains mycotoxin test? If you suspect mold exposure. <laughs> so um, it's really the only, well, there was another game in town, but again, there's, there's pros and cons to the methodologies. Um, I think mass spec is just the way to go for any chemical testing you want to do versus ELISA. Uh, similar to like infectious disease, right? So we're all checking for viruses and mold, viruses and Lyme, et cetera. Antibodies, which are, you know, binding type things, ELISA type tests, um, are, they have a false positive issue. So viruses can cross react with Lyme tests makes you go crazy. You're not sure if it's there or not. Um, you don't get that with mass spec. So it's there, the peak is there or it's not. So it's uh, much more specific and sensitive. Perfect. You know, and with that, we are at time. I want to thank everybody for your questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all of them. There was over 45 questions asked in that Q&A, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, uh, Dr. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. Any closing comments you want to add in here? No, it's been a pleasure. Um, I have, again, the, the, the other kind of full mold um, talk I do may be available at GPL, I don't know, or, or IMMH, but uh, if anyone's interested in more uh, detail about that, they could look it up or watch the next one. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, with that, we'll let you hop off and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We will be sending out a copy of the recording as well as the slides for everyone so they can watch along and follow along with the recording should you want to rewatch it or weren't able to join. If you have a few minutes to stick around, we'd love for you to stay with us here. Um, I'll be walking through a quick demonstration of Rupa Health for those of you who are able to stick around. Um, and let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So if you missed the beginning, my name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner part partnerships at Rupa Health. We are the organization that has been hosting all of these presentations over the last couple of weeks, last few months. Um, if you're new to it, welcome on board. Who is Rupa Health? What do we do? Why do we do it? So essentially, Rupa Health is a platform that is designed to alleviate and eliminate a lot of the pain points that can be associated with 
functional lab testing. Um, we partner with over 20 plus different labs all in one place. So no longer are you gonna have to go and create separate accounts with all your labs. You're able to have one account with Rupa Health and place your orders within seconds, as well as track and manage those results in one spot. So as you can see, we partner with over 20 labs. This is our lab test catalog. Great planes you'll see in there is one of our amazing partners that we work with. Beyond just the ability to order everything in one place, you know, a lot of those pain points that I hear about speaking to our practitioners on a daily basis have to do with the patient experience. Um, everything from, you know, the test taking process alone, all the hand holding that can be associated with, you know, taking these tests to managing things like specimen issues, price transparency, all that, right? So as soon as you place that order on Rupa Health, we can effectively take it from there. So I'm going to jump in just spend the next 10 minutes or so walking through Rupa Health, highlighting exactly who we are, what we do, how our product works. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out directly to me. Um, I'm going to send a follow-up email later this afternoon, so you'll have my contact information. And if you're interested in scheduling some time, there'll be a link directly within there to uh, schedule some time right on my calendar. So let's hop in and just show you just very quickly how easy it is to place an order on Rupa Health. To start an order on our platform, it's as simple as knowing your patient's first name, last name, email address. We collect everything else directly from the patient required to complete the order. This makes things more streamlined for you and your practice, as well as ensures the accuracy of the information that we're receiving from the patient. It makes things easier for everybody involved, right? Once you get to this order screen, right up here at the top, you'll see that we can create custom bundles. A custom bundle being a set of tests a set of blood panels from really any one of our partner labs that you want to work with. And that way it's as simple as clicking in one time and those tests, those blood panels are added directly into your cart straight away without having to search through the entire catalog. Below that, you can actually create a favorites list as well. A favorites list consists of individual tests, individual blood panels that you're looking to order, that you're commonly ordering. Again, the idea here is to drive efficiency and make sure that these tests are the first ones that you see and you can order them straight away. So if I'm looking to order that um, Great Plains test, I have it straight up here at the top. Here's my mycotox, there it is. I wanna go ahead and order um, anything, the oat test right here at the top. So that way it's one click, those tests are added right to my cart without having to, again, search through an entire catalog of 2000 tests. Below that, I do have access to the entire lab catalog down below. So if I am looking for a specific test that's not in my bundle or in my favorites, I can find that straight away. Once those tests are added into your cart, you have the ability to schedule that out in advance. So if you are looking to retest a patient down the line, I can schedule an order out, automating that process. Um, those tests are added right into my cart. You'll notice that they are um, have two prices available, right? So one being that $399 price, the other that being that $249 price. So how does our pricing work? We offer wholesale practitioner prices, meaning the same prices that you would get having an account directly with any one of our partner labs are the same prices that we offer here at Rupa Health. Additionally, those are the same prices that your patients will be paying. So whether you're paying for the test and billing the patient outside of our platform or having us manage billing directly with your patients, your patients are always going to be paying that lower possible price. Additionally, it'll default to having the kits drop ship to your patients. So no longer will you have to stock any kits in office, no longer having to stock any inventory, but if that is something that you are interested in doing and that's how your operations work, let me know because we can most likely accommodate that for you. The way that we generate our revenue is very straightforward. We charge a 7% processing and ordering fee on each order, which is paid for by whoever's paying for the tests. So what that means is if you're having us manage billing directly with your patients, which is how the heavy majority of our practitioners and our users prefer to have it, the patients will be the one absorbing that 7% processing and ordering fee. Rupa Health, in effect, will be free for you. Um, there is no sign-up cost. There's no subscription fee. Anything of that nature, Rupa Health is a free account. The only way that we generate our revenue here is through that 7% processing and ordering fee. It'll default to having us build a patient, but as I mentioned previously, you do have the option of paying for this test yourself and then managing the billing separately outside of our platform. There's a number of practitioners and clinics that we work with that choose this method. You know, if there is, you know, bundle programs that you're operating with and that's how you operate, that would be one example of that, right? 
You can add notes for the patient. You can add notes for RUPA. You can add ICD-10 codes. So if the patient does want to submit a super bill to their insurance for reimbursement after the fact, we do have that option available. What happens is once you add those ICD-10 codes, we will go ahead and send the patient over a template to walk them through how to generate that super bill and you're good to go there. You don't have to manage that process. But if it's nothing else, it's as simple as clicking send a patient. Now. Once that order has been sent to the patient, we can return to the dashboard and we can track it straight away. You'll see it appear here at the top, that's pending payment. And as soon as that patient pays for that order, we're able to hop in here and we can start tracking the status of that order. So we'll consistently update the status of your orders. Um, you'll be able to see when the sample arrived at the lab, for example, and when you can expect those results to be in. So you can always plan accordingly um, and know how to provide your next steps with the patient. Once those results are in, you're able to access them all through Rupa Health. So again, another huge feature of Rupa is not having to go to each individual portal to place your orders, but also not having to go to each individual portal to receive your results. You'll receive an email once those results are ready and you're able to hop into your Rupa Health dashboard and download them straight away. These are the same exact results that you would be getting should you be working directly with the lab. We're not making any interpretation. We're not making any adjustments to the results. The exact same that you would be receiving you're able to send them to the patient. You have full control of when the patient receives these results. We won't send them to your patient without your consent. Again, full control. Should you need some assistance interpreting the results, you have the ability to schedule a clinical consult directly with that lab through Rupa Health. Um, and then finally, you have access to the digital requisition should it be available. From there, once you've had the opportunity to review these results, you can change the status yourself, mark it as reviewed, and even order again. So this is another way that you can reschedule those tests for your patient. Let's say you want to test them again six months down the line. We can automate that and leverage our technology to make your life easier. The whole goal here behind Rupa Health is really to save you and your clinic time and money, right? When we're saving you time and money, that provides you the opportunity to see more patients and spend more time growing your business. So what we've seen so far is on Rupa Health, how easy it is to not only place your orders, but also track and manage. I'm going to show you very quickly exactly what it looks like from the patient end, right? Um, now, the patient experience, in my opinion, is equally as important, <laughs> if not more important, uh, to the lab boarding process, right? And, and a big reason for that is that there's a few, um, you know. One, I think it can take up the most time in your practice if you're stuck on a call having to do things like holding the patient's hand and, and managing the whole patient experience, uh, coordinating phlebotomies, all these things that will ultimately take time out of your day. Um, to, of course, ensuring that the patient's complying with the tests. Um, so there's a lot that goes into the patient experience. And the goal here at Rupa is as soon as you place that order, we want to take it from there. So once you place that order on Rupa Health, this is what the patient sees. We'll go ahead and reach out, and this is an example of, of what the patient will see should they be the one paying for the test, what the different payment options that we accept. So one huge call out here at Rupa is not only can we do cash and credit, but we can also accept HSA, FSA, as well as setting up a three-month interest-free payment plan with the patient. Um, these are huge. Our patients love these additional options, and really what this is providing is a way for us to overcome one significant barrier that is seen with these functional medicine tests, and that's simply cost, right? They're very expensive a lot of times. And so if your patient is experiencing financial hardships, what are we doing to help alleviate those? And providing these different payment options is one of the ways. From there, we'll go ahead and collect the additional information necessary to complete the order, shipping information, billing information, demographic information, and then we'll highlight the tests that was ordered for them. You'll notice that we break everything down very transparently. Should you be the one paying for the tests, right? We will go ahead and notify the patient still, but there'll be some key differentiators with the communications, primarily that we will not be collecting any billing information and therefore we will not be showing the cost of the test. That is completely up to you. All right. Um, beyond that, nothing changes with the patient experience, whether you're paying or the patient's paying. The cost of the test is still going to be the same, as well as we will still manage end to end the patient experience. And by that, I mean, we will send over communications, we'll send over FAQs, instructions, videos on how to take the test. 
will walk the patient through how to fill out the requisition form. Should there be a phlebotomy, we will help coordinate the phlebotomy. We can either customize those instructions based on your recommendation. For example, if you're lucky enough to have an in-house phlebotomist, we can instruct the patient to come see you. Um, if not, we'll send over the options based on the lab that they're working with, as each lab that we work with that does blood draws has their own directory of resources to send to the patient. But if they have any questions, whether it's how to take the test properly, um, or, hey, I don't like these phlebotomy options that were sent my way, we can go ahead and, and facilitate answering those questions on your behalf, again, so you don't have to. We will walk the patient end to end through how to take the test. Additionally, we'll follow up with the patient. And I think this is something that is so important, but can be easily overlooked, right? You know, following with the patients is something that generally is manual for most clinics, um, having to pick up the phone, call a patient. And if you and your staff are overworked and simply don't have the time, it can be easy for this to fall by the wayside. We automate this process. So again, we're leveraging a technology to provide an experience that has come to be expected in 2022 from just patients and really everyone in general, right? Um, all this has led to a compliance rate up above 85%. From there, you're notified as each individual result comes in. So let's say that you are you know, working with three to four different tests for an individual patient from different labs. We're not waiting for the bulk and the entirety of those results to come in. You'll be notified as each individual result comes in so you can plan accordingly with your patients. So you know, with that, those are the main components to Rupa Health. Um, how to place an order, how to track all of your results in one place, and then how to um, manage your patients experience more seamlessly. But that's not it. Um, we consider ourselves not just a place to place your orders, uh, but also more of a platform where you can continue to learn, continue to evolve, and continue to grow your practice, which is why you're all here, right? Um, you're in what we call Ruby University. Rupa University is a set of weekly classes that we host where we bring on practitioners, influencers within the functional medicine landscape to chat about topics that are extremely important and impacting, whether it's you know, deep diving into mycotox to how to help grow your practice, GI map versus GI effects showdowns. Um, so we'll consistently pump out this content on a weekly basis. So we hope to see you again um, to the next Rupa University. We, of course, offer support not only for patients, but for practitioners. Uh, we can build out your account not only for solo practitioners, but for larger clinics. So whether you think you're too small or too large, don't worry about that. We likely can work with you. I would love to have a conversation actually directly with you to chat about how we can set up a program that will make sure your, your, your practice will be uh, benefited by, by, by Rupa Health. Um, but beyond that, everybody, thank you so much for joining today's presentation. Again, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. Look out for an email coming your way with uh, a follow-up within the next few days. We'll go ahead and send out a recording. Um, but with that, everyone, I hope you have an amazing rest of your Wednesday, and we hope to see you again next week.